Hi, this is Dr. Lewis Cady coming to you from the mini conference room here at Cady Wells Institute where we have a particularly interesting piece of equipment, the quotient diagnostic system that I'll be telling you about in a moment. This piece of equipment is actually for the improvement in the diagnosis and management and treatment for the condition known as ADD or ADHD or attention deficit disorder. Reminds me of one of my patient's mothers that says, my kid has the ADD without the H. And she was talking about the purely inattentive kind, not the hyperactive. But since George Still uh, came up with this concept of diagnosis of ADD in 1902, uh, this condition has one way or the other continued to be evident and continued to be diagnosed by psychiatrists. Now, up until 1994, uh, the so-called DSM-3 revision, or R, DSM-3R was used, and there was a, a little bit of imprecision with that one because it was what I called the 678, who do we appreciate way to diagnose ADHD. There were 14 symptoms, of which some of them were inattentive and some of them were hyperactive and impulsive. And the way that the diagnosis was made was that you had to have eight symptoms present for six months before the age of seven to get the diagnosis. Six, seven, eight. Eight out of 14. In 1994, the DSM-4 came out and this is the way psychologists and therapists and psychiatrists diagnose mental health conditions. And this time they reformulated it. And now there were 18 symptoms, nine of which were of the impulsive type, nine of which are of the hyperactive, uh, excuse me, nine of which are the purely inattentive type, and nine of them are the hyperactive impulsive type. And to get either one of those diagnoses, either the inattentive type or the hyperactive impulsive type, you have to have six out of nine in that cluster of nine symptoms. So six out of nine of the inattentive gets you that diagnosis ADD of the inattentive type. Six out of nine down here gets you the diagnosis of ADHD of the hyperactive impulsive type. And six in both or more gets you the diagnosis of ADHD of the combined type. So if that was a dessert, that would be like the banana split with the cherry and, and whipped cream on top. That, that's where you meet all the diagnostic criteria. Now, the problem with diagnosing it purely based on a checklist is that the clinical history is not obtained. And, and let me just reflect uh, to you, our viewer, that sometimes I get calls or the front office staff at Katie Wellness Institute gets calls from parents saying, I would like my kid checked for ADD or I would like my kid tested for ADD. And every time I hear about some parent that wants their kid checked for ADHD, I, I think about chicken sexers and turning them over and, you know, what says, you know, that's, that's checking. There is no test per se that has been available for ADD, and even with this, the diagnosis of ADD or ADHD is made based on the clinical history, and that includes the symptoms, which you would see in a checklist, the mental status exam, which is what is the child or adult doing, and the exclusion of any other medical or psychiatric problems. Now, by the way, in this year, 2013, the new DSM-5 came out, replacing what we have been using since 1994. The DSM-5 has modified these symptoms just slightly. There are still nine inattentive, still nine uh, hyperactive impulsive, still have to have six in either domain if you're a kid or an adolescent to get it, but if you're an adult, you only have to have five. And in, in either domain. And the reason is, as an adult, you're supposed to improve and mature. And so if you have five symptoms, um, forget six. If you still have five symptoms, then you're having problems. So that is the new diagnostic criteria that we're using. And this is what we're going to be using when patients come to see us. 
Now, one of the problems is when you get in those head scratching cases and you're not exactly sure what's going on. Sometimes people with bipolar disorder can be very hyperactive and impulsive, but when their bipolar is treated, then, they're a, th then they don't have any type of ADD symptoms. So let me tell you about this quotient test, which is a test that we will use sometimes when there are either diagnostic concerns or forensic concerns. For example, if I'm trying to establish in a forensic case that somebody has real problems containing themselves or controlling their impulsivity, then it's very useful. What this test does, it's based on a Macintosh computer, which is buried in the guts here. And this is actually the screen of a 13-inch MacBook uh, Pro. And you'll notice on this machine that there are a couple of little lenses right here. The way this test is administered is the uh, tester will put this band with the little bead on top right over their forehead like so and it's positioned and then they will face the machine and their height will be moved up and down so that these lenses are aimed right at that little bead. And then on the screen, this is just the, the welcome home screen, but on the screen, and I will hold this very still so that you can see it. If you were a child, you will be uh, a child defined as 6 to 12 years of age. You will have this as the good target and this as the bad target. So if you see this star, you hit the space bar. If you see that star, the five-pointed one, you don't hit the space bar. So this is 6 to 12, and that test takes 15 minutes. If you are an adult, it gets more challenging. Now you have three different stars here, all of which are targets, and this four-pointed star is the non-target. So the rule is hit the space bar every time for the target, don't hit the space bar for the non-target. What we get with this type of testing, I'll go ahead and take the headband off right now, is we get measurements in a number of domains. The first measurement that, that we get is, does the person fidget? Do they move? And it's not only hyperactive and impulsive ADDers that move a lot, but also people with inattentiveness can sometimes have higher movement than uh, normal. And so this is actually plotted out on a statistically normed percentile basics, basis, and some of the parameters that are looked at for movement are how many movements in the test, uh, what was the total, uh, the total square area in centimeters that the head traversed through space in front of these lenses. Uh, if you were to lay each one of those movements end to end, how long would it be on a piece of string, like in meters? And so we can get this to the nearest percentile. This test, and not only the movement, but also the concentration, this test is scored entirely differently from the test that you might remember in school. In this test, if you are at the 17th percentile and up, you pass. Because the 16th percentile is negative one standard deviation below the mean. That's for all you statistics fans out there. And so if you're there or worse, you fail. You got to be at least better than negative one standard deviation below the mean. So again, 17 or up, you pass. Now, with the concentration, with those star targets that you're supposed to hit the space bar for and not hit the space bar for the non target, we can actually score you, or the machine scores you in four different dimensions. First of all, how much of the time are you paying attention? That, that's if you're hitting the space bar every time the little star goes by. How much of the time are you impulsive? That's if you can't hold your fire and end up hitting the space bar when the non-target goes by. How much of the time are you distracted? That's where the target goes by and you don't even flinch because you're really not paying attention. And how much of the time are you disengaged? And that's, that's where the machine just doesn't sense that you're interacting with it in any meaningful way. And so we can score this 
again to the nearest percentile and we can determine how much of the time you're paying attention, how much of the time you're impulsive, how much of the time you're distracted, and how much of the time, if any, you are disengaged. And we can also count the number of shifts uh, between those concentration states. This machine will actually score your child or you, if you're an adult taking the test, every 30 seconds. So every 30 second, a little 30 seconds, a little block goes by and it will determine if you're paying attention, impulsive, or distracted. The really wonderful thing about this test is it improves the diagnostic sensitivity of ADD. It excludes, and this is critical, it excludes kids that do not have ADD. I never want a child that does not have ADD to be treated with a medication. It's bad medicine, it's unethical, it's unprofessional, it's sloppy practice, and simply because your child has a, and I'll, I'll do a little sketching in here of detail, a boring teacher, and so the kid fidgets in class. That does not mean the kid has a concentration problem. That means the kid has a boring teacher problem. <clears throat> now, I, I, hate to, uh, I hate to do anything which would run down this, this uh, very valued profession, so let me just tell you. I have been a teacher, my father was a teacher, and my mother was a teacher, and I am not impugning the entire profession, but just like there are going to be some doctors that listen and some don't, and some doctors that are entertaining and some aren't, and some doctors that have lots of personality and some don't, there are going to be some teachers that are very animated and some that are just going to be a little on the boring side. So if that's the kind that your kid has, and there could be a wonderful person, but if that's what's going on with your kid, or they're playing too many video games, or they're sensitive to food additives or dyes in the food, or if they have an IgG food sensitivity that is causing inflammatory changes in their brain, all of those could affect their ability to focus and pay attention and concentrate. And so this test is very helpful in excluding that. Uh, we re the other thing about this test that we really like is it helps us avoid excess use of medication. If, for example, in our baseline uh, test of you or your child, we come up with the fact that there's a whole lot of impulsivity and a whole lot of inattentiveness and a whole lot of distractibility, and I use a medication and get your child to where there is just a solid bar of green going across total total concentration, 100% concentration, and it looks like there's a laser sight um, on this thing and it just doesn't budge. That means the kid is sitting there like a hyper-focused or over-focused zombie and they are on too much medication. That No child should get 100% across the top and that means it's time to back it down. So this is very useful in terms of diagnosis for kids. Now let me talk about treatment because when I came to Evansville all the way back in 1993, one of the things that mothers told me was, please don't turn my kid into a zombie with Ritalin. And all too frequently, kids were being turned into zombies on Ritalin because there weren't very good many, there weren't all that good uh, medications available at the time. And sometimes physicians would just use one medication and keep cranking and cranking and cranking and Sometimes they push it all the way to where the child was zombied out. I'm pleased to tell you that these days we have lots of excellent medications that are available for psychiatry in, in this country, the U.S. Uh, they're, the ones that I particularly like are the sustained release ones that last all through the day and so the child doesn't have to take the medication at school. Nobody has to know. If you're an adult, you don't have to pack it to work. You take it in the morning. It's like a 12-hour, 14-hour pair of extended contact lenses that you don't have to take out at eight hours. So that's pretty cool. Um, there has probably never been a better time to be diagnosed with ADD because we have never had the medications that allow the precise and non-side effect inducing uh, symptom control that we have. Before I close out, I just want to share uh, a couple of stories with you. 
Uh, these are two stories that I tell my patients, no matter if they're little munchkin patients or CPAs or attorneys or doctors, all of which I treat. I tell them about Goldilocks and Cinderella, and I tell them that my version is pretty, pretty short. My version of Goldilocks goes like this. Goldilocks broke into the three bears' place and found three bowls of porridge. One was too cold, one was too hot, and one was, and you remember, just right. And I tell them medication is like that. So only God Almighty or the divinity of your choice knows what dose your child or you should be on a medication. I don't know. You don't know. Nobody knows. We don't have the, the Star Trek tricorders that we can scan people's neurotransmitters with yet. So based on that, it, it seems to me reasonable to start from a therapeutically humble perspective, which is I certainly don't know what dose of medication you or your child need to be on. So the simple thing is to start low, because if I start low, then it will not cause side effects. It won't do any good, but it won't cause side effects. Then we raise the temperature we're looking for just right. Just right means works for the issue, child or you, calms down, concentrates, focuses, not hyperactive, not impulsive, everybody's happy, and the child is not having side effects, or you're not having side effects. If we get it too hot, then it doesn't matter if it's working for symptom control or not, you're having side effects or your child is having side effects. So that is Goldilocks and the Three Bears. And I tell parents when I'm treating their child, we do not want it too hot. If it seems to be getting too hot, go down. Do not, do not keep dosing it at a level where your child is having side effects. And usually doing it this way, there are no problematic side effects that emerge. If there's a side effect, it's just a little tiny side effect, parent goes down, everything's fine. The other story that I tell, again, my munchkins all the way up to doctors and lawyers and CPAs is the story of Cinderella. Uh, my version of this one is also brief. It goes like this. Cinderella had the wicked stepmother and the stepsisters. The fairy godmother came by, did the magic wand action, fitted her with the fancy duds, and sent her to the party. But when the clock struck 12, what happened? Well, you remember that. The dress turned back into rags, and the coach turned back into a pumpkin, and the horses turned back into mice or rats, I forget. The moral of the story is there was a time limit to that spell. And there are actually three things about that spell in Cinderella that are very useful to remember. One is, how fast did the spell go into effect? With the fairy godmother, it was boom, instantaneous. It was an instantaneous onset of the spell. And then how long did the spell last? Well, I'm not sure that we know when the spell went into effect, but we know it lasted until the clock struck 12. And then finally, how did the spell end? And with Cinderella, it ended very abruptly. That's the reason she had to get out of the party. Now, we've talked about Goldilocks with medications, but Cinderella is also very important because all three of those aspects that I just told you about are relevant for the treatment of ADD. You want to know how fast the spell goes into effect. There's one medication, Focalin XR, for example, that has uh, clinical studies to show that in 30 minutes, it's at least partially effective, and in an hour, it's very effective. So I have used that medication, Focalin or Focalin XR, to, in, in my idiom, keep little Johnny from getting kicked off the bus. Little Johnny takes it at 6.30, gets on the bus at 7, he doesn't get kicked off the bus. There are others like Vyvanse that the, the pharmaceutical company shows that it, it kicks in in as early as two hours, but they don't, have, uh, they don't have stats before that. And that one lasts 12 to 14 hours. There is a new kid on the block, Quilivant XR, which is the only sustained release Ritalin in a liquid, and it lasts 12 hours. And it's very smooth, and the other interesting thing, not only do these last 12 hours, but when they fade, they fade gently. And that's very important. You want the spell to fade gently at the end, because if it cuts off abruptly, then all the hyper and all the inattentiveness that was bottled up during the day comes out with a vengeance and you get what's called stimulant rebound. And actually in the peer-reviewed medical literature, there's a case report 
of a young child that was thought to have bipolar disorder because she just came unglued in the afternoon and later it was determined that it was just stimulant rebound. So you want a reasonably onset, reasonably fast onset of action, either 8 to 12 hours of duration uh, of effect depending on the clinical situation and a gentle taper at the end. And those are the types of medications that we use here. So if you would like to learn more, you can go to our website, uh, katiewellness.com. We also have apps that are available on our, an app that is available on both the iTunes store and the Android store that you can download, just search under Katie Wellness. And if you would like more, more information, you can call the front office here at CWI at 812-429-0772. I hope that this has been helpful to you. Thanks for listening.